so my talk is called Beam NIFs Made Easy. Uh, we're going to be using Zig to do some dangerous things. So first, let's talk about NIFs. Who in the audience has used NIFs uh, knowingly? Yes, yeah. And mo most of, m many of you have also used NIFs unknowingly. For example, if you're using um, any encryption, uh, if you're an Elixir developer, pretty much uh, that stuff all runs through. Uh, uh, Bcrypt, for example, runs through a NIF. And of course, the Beam itself has NIFs in it now. A lot of the, a lot of the um, standard library stuff is implemented in NIFs. So how did I get onto this NIF, NIF journey? Um, this is kind of a result of a crazy yak shave. Um, a long time ago, I was writing some data center orchestration software. Uh, basically, I was provisioning virtual machines, and um, you know we needed to check in to make sure that the hosts for the virtual machines were working. Um, and uh, how are we doing that? We're using ICMP ping. Um, the socket module for ICM the socket module only hit an OTP 22, and if I recall correctly, ICMP came in at OTP 23, um, and it hadn't hit yet. Uh, so, um, what was I doing? Well, I was shelling out to fping or ping. Um, so, right, and um, what's the problem with this? Has, has anybody done this, actually? Any, anybody? No, okay, so nobody's done this before. Well, I'll tell you what the problem is. You get zombie processes, and that is like, that's, and basically, at one point we lost, uh, con lost communication with our server because there was something like 10,000 fping processes running, uh, and it was hogging them. I mean, the latency got really high, we could still like, like log in and see what was going on, but it was really slow and the user experience had uh, had degraded. Um, luckily, we didn't have too many users at the time, so I was e able to like schedule a repeated reset of the of the server, so uh, so that that didn't accumulate. Um, so here are your options. You can port out to ping or fping. Uh, not not the best for the reason that I described. You can maybe make a sidecar server that's not in the beam. Um, who wants to do that? Uh, and or you could learn how to embed low-level code in the beam, which is like obviously the best choice. So that's what I decided to do. Um, and so here are some pitfalls of of, of making NIFs. So one, don't ever seg fault. Um, that will uh, that will breach your uh, your um, failure domain um, concepts inside the inside the beam and. Um, you know, you're just gonna you're just gonna have a bad time because all of your stateful data that the beam is so good at managing will just go and disappear. Uh, there's void pointer all over the place. I don't yeah, like so this is like type erasure and see it's very dangerous to like you know manage void pointers um, and uh, you know you just have to keep that in mind. It's a good way to seg fault. It's a good way to lose information. Uh, the documentation for CNIFs in the OTP uh, documentation, it's not the greatest, gotta say. Um, and C build tools can be really tricky. And ultimately, like, you know, the reason why we have to have this uh, NIF interface is because we're moving from the, dy the dynamic typing land of the beam, where a term can have multiple different types. And, um, and then we need to somehow uh, make that fit in with the static typing of low-level languages like C, uh, Rust, uh, uh, or as we'll see, um, Zig. So when I was doing this, I was, I was like, well, we maybe need to have a, a better way of doing this, like maybe some sort of framework. And I wanted to come up with a design space that was uniquely suited for, uh, for this sort of uh, um, coding. So here's what I came up with. First, I wanted to embed the low-level language inside of, inside of um, Elixir at the time. Um, and I, I wanted that for code review purposes so that when you, when you, so instead of just like importing a C library that lives somewhere in some weird place, you can actually see it in line with your code. And you can say, ah, I see how this interacts with the module that I'm calling it from. Um, and the contents of that code should basically be transparently translated into the Beam idioms. And there's lots of like finicky tasks, like how do you take a beam term that's in and unwrap it and pull out the integer that comes from it? Are you going to get that right? Um, you know, there, there, there's tasks like figuring out how many arguments your function was called with, um, and you could get that wrong. And I, I, I wanted all those tasks that you have to do to get get these things right completely gone. So this is the design space for for Ziggler, um, and so. I picked Zig as the uh, as the programming language that I wanted to uh, implement this in. A very strange choice. Um, I'm not really like a I'm not really like a programming language explorer. I've only ever picked like three programming languages in my long career, I guess. Uh, by picked, I mean like 
not forced to use, but like, actually, hey, I want to use this plugin. So Elixir was one of them, um, and Zig is another one, and the third one was Ruby, uh, way back when. <clears throat> so, um, so, so, you know, I, I really felt that this was a strong choice. I saw something in the Zig, in, in the Zig language a long time ago, and, and I said, all right, let's, let's, just, let's just dive into it and excuse to learn Zig and to have fun learning more about the Beam. Okay, so for those of you who are, aren't familiar with what Zig is, it's a system low-level programming language. Uh, the best way to think of it is as a, quote, replacement C. It is explicitly designed to, uh, to be C without the bad parts. So there's like less, um, uh, there's no undefined behavior except, uh, except if you're compiling for speed. Um, and, um, and so when you're in developer mode, you, you'll catch all the places where, you, where things could go wrong, at least that's the idea. Um, and uh, there's no, uh, there's no uh, lexical um, uh, macros, which can do some really weird things. Um, and, um, and it's got metaprogramming, so you can have generics in Zig. I'm not going to go over specifics about the Zig syntax. I'm just going to throw you guys into it. You all will be reading Zig code as part of this, uh, as part of this talk. Um, but the philosophy of Zig is that anything that C can do, Zig can do better. And that's from the actual um, handling of all sorts of weird things that C throws at you that are kind of like a legacy from you know, 30 years ago uh, all the way to like the build chain, right? So, so no make, no auto make, no, no auto conf, none of, none of these things that can have sharp edges. And as a result, Zig winds up having a very nice developer experience. Um, cross compilation is very easy. Uh, in fact, it's so good that if you ever use CGO, which is like a Go that can do C NIFs basically, except in Golang, the at, Go normally has a really great cross compilation story, but uh, if you use CGO, they say, hey, um, uh, to cross-compile your, your C NIFs for Go, please use Zig. Um, and, there's, and, and the other part of Zig is that there is seamless interop with C. This goes with the whole designed as a replacement for C explicitly. Uh, Evadne talked about the strangler pattern. Zig is actively using the strangler pattern to try and kill C. Um, okay. Uh, as a result of this journey, I discovered that Zig is a really good fit for Elixir. Um, the build system, so like Elixir, uh, Zig has a build system that's in the same language. So this is kind of part of that getting rid of make and autoconf and automake and cmake and all those things. Um, and in both languages, there's this concept of compile time execution. So in Elixir, you can basically run Elixir at compile time, and it's a scripting language for the compiled language. And the same thing in a similar way exists in Zig. Like parts of your Zig are going to be running at compile time, and they they will change the execution core of your function. But it's not via macros; it's via something a little bit different um, that you'll you'll get to see in a moment. Um, and for both languages, I found that like ergonomics are a top priority. The one weird thing about Zig that I would like to like touch upon right now is that. It's in this kind of odd space. It's a duct type language um, and compile time dynamic, but it's also type safe at runtime. Um, I, I don't think any other language has really explored this. I think maybe Jai is this kind of new language that's still closed source is also in this space. But for example, um, you can have code that is in an if statement inside of your, inside of your uh, function block that uh, depends on some sort of type that might have, so say it's a struct and it's got a certain field, and if the if statement guards against ever being called when, when that function receives that struct, it'll never execute this code, um, and then it'll instead execute this other code, um, and in the guarded code, you could have like a dereference to that, to that field, right? Uh, which in most programming languages would say, hey, you're getting past a, you're getting past this type that doesn't have this field, I can't compile this. But Zig knows at compile time which branch it is, and it'll say, I I'm, I'm not gonna ever see that field dereference. We're good. Okay, so um, first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about type marshalling. And this is the process of taking terms in the beam and bringing it into, uh, bringing it into uh, Zig. So row three, get ready. All right, so y'all can see this. Um, so you can see here I've got on the, on the left 
uh, an example of how you use, Zig, or use Ziggler to put Zig inside of uh, Elixir. So you can see I have created a module, right? And the key thing is that I've got this use Zig clause, which says we're going to use Zig in this module. And I've embedded Zig code directly into my Elixir. Um, it's inside the sigil Z uh, uh, code block string, right? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and uncomment some of these things. And first person on the right-hand side here, can you give me some colors? Just like some colors. Two, two, two colors. Blue, blue and yellow, okay. Great. All right, um, already you can see that we've kind of got the situation where it's red underlined something for me, so let's take a look at that. Uh, it said expected semicolon. Oh, I forgot to put a semicolon in here. Uh, all right, and let's look at this uh, run function. Basically, we're going to take this color value, right, that we're passing into this function. It's a pub function, which means this get, it gets exported. And when Ziggler sees a pub function, it says, oh, I think you want that to be inside the module. And then it's going to take this color, and it's just going to do print. Um, so we're going to see uh, we're going to see what it gets passed, and an enum, which is what this color type is, is just a, a, a symbols that are backed by a number, right? So that's like C. Um, okay, S somebody over here, if you could call this function from the beam, what would be your ideal way of calling this function? Uh, you know, uh, that would ex uh, com convey like what's going on in a in a lucid way in your code. What would you use? Anyone? Enum.runblue? OK. Well, uh, unfortunately, that was not what I was looking for. <laughs> How about this? Uh, that's Adam Blue, for those of you who are not familiar with Elixir. Uh oh. Uh, oh, no. Oh, right, had to recompile it. Uh, okay, so we recompile it, and then, uh, and then let's run that. And then, so you can see here, it was correctly passed this enums blue, uh, and then that's backed by the integer zero. Great. All right, now I'm going to uncomment this, and then we're going to see how we're going to return blue, and the reverse uh, of it works. So we're going to recompile this, and uh oh. Use of undeclared identifier blue. Okay, so what blue is is it's an enum, right? And to have a to have to have that um, to that is a variable. And to show that we're doing an enum, we need to do that dot blue, right? And then if I call build, we get the atom blue back. Okay, so now I'm going to show you marshalling integers. This is kind of a boring example um, because, uh, I mean, 32-bit integers. Can somebody give me like some number of bits that you would like to see that isn't boring? 60 bytes. You want to see 60 bytes? Okay, we can do that. And so this is just going to take uh, the number and then add one, right? So this is pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward. Uh, I'm going to just pick some number here, right? Great. But the cool thing is that if we engage the help on this function, do you know two to the 60th power off the top of your head? Oops. Help. Okay, so you can see that uh, two to the sixty-fourth power is one one five two nine two whatever that is. Um, okay, so I'm going to show you another interesting one. We can do uh, one hundred and twenty-eight. Uh, has anybody ever seen anybody? Does anybody know the limitations of how to, how to do NIFs with with uh, with numbers? What's the biggest number that you can normally get into a NIF? Sixty-four bits. Right. Do you think this will work? <laughs> let's, let's do something that's way bigger than 64 bits. This is bigger than 64 bits, right? Not yet. 
that's more than 64 bits, right? Everybody agree? Hey. So we're able to do numbers that are even bigger than 64 bits if you should need them. Okay, let's move on to lists. Uh, I will go ahead and, well. So um, this is a function here that will take uh, a list of, of floats and then, uh, and then like add them up together, right? And so, you know, how should you be able to, how would you want to in input something that's a list of floats? Probably as a list of floats, right? And then let's just do one, two, and three. And so the sum is six, as you would expect. Um, so I'm gonna show you the reverse, which is to take a, uh, an array of integers and then send them back to uh, send them back to the beam. So we're going to call this array result function here, which returns an array of three 32-bit uh, integers. And you can see it's given me back a binary instead of a list. Why did it do that? Because up top here I told it, hey, for the array result function, please give me back a binary. Well, what if I remove that? and recompile. You can see instead it'll convert them straight to 32-bit uh, integers. Okay, um, I'll show you some structs. So a struct in zig is just like a struct in uh, uh, struct in C. Um, so here we have uh, something that I'm calling an affine vector, and it's a struct of three uh, F32s plus an A value, which is F32. If you know anything about 3D graphics, you might understand why such a thing would be uh, important. We're also going to have an optional value, um, which uh, is a struct of type sum opt, uh, <laughs> which is uh, which has to be Boolean and um, that's going to have a default assignment of null. Also, the a value has a de default assignment of 1.0. And what we're going to do is we're just going to we're just going to pass it into this function and return it back. Okay. So, oops. Sorry. Um, so probably you would want to input this as a map, right? So. Let's just do 1.0 and 2.0. What's going to go wrong when I do this? I skipped Z, right? Oops. Well, the good thing is that I get this error, this argument error that tells me that I expected, I got X uh, 1.0, Y 2.0, but I missed Z. Um, so let's add Z in. And then now you can see, hey, like, uh, Here's, here's the value that you would expect, and it's go, gone ahead and it's detected that A was optional, and it didn't ask me for it. Um, what if I do a type error? What if I try and do add options, right? So some opt uh, options. And then I put in some opt, and then I give it something that isn't a Boolean. So let's give it like some number. 42, great. And then you can see here, it gives a detailed argument error saying that I expected to see a Boolean in some opt, but instead I got 42, which isn't, which isn't correct. So there's strong guarding for you to actually put in what it needs into this statically typed area from the dynamically typed um, beam. Um, okay, I'll do one more, because I think this is interesting. Um, suffice it to say, there's support for all sorts of different data types inside the beam, or inside of uh, inside of the beam. The corresponding data types inside of the zig inside of the zig statically type system. But the one that I want to bring attention to is a beam resource. Okay, so has anybody worked with NIF resources before? Okay, NIF resources are really hard because you've got to pass around these void function pointers and double void pointers and then all this stuff. And I decided that. There should be a nice way for you to manage these resources where it assembles everything that you need, 
um, without having to have any fuss and with type safety. So here's an example of how you create a number resource. And the short story of what a resource is, is when you have a value in your low level language that is tied to the uh, beam garbage collector. So we're gonna call this store function and it's gonna re return a uh, create. What this try is, is a way of, uh, of basically saying, telling, um, uh, telling uh, Zig, hey, I know this could is an erroring process, but just like forward the error up. Um, we're not gonna encounter the error, error in this case. So I'm gonna do a uh, resource, and then we're gonna store the number 47. And what do we get back? We get back a reference. So a reference is just how the beam, when you create a, 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 res, a resource in, um, in your, uh, your low-level language, it wraps it and attaches it to this, to this reference term. And when that reference term uh, gets garbage collected, it then can engage the destructor function that you provide. And here I've provided a destructor, destructor function in the callbacks for this resource where it'll just take the value of the payload and then it'll just say, I destroyed this number. How do we uh, engage the garbage collector on this, anyone? Process dot, ex process dot, uh, yeah, exactly. So you would, uh, in, uh, right, so in Elixir you do process dot exit. So I'm gonna kill. And then you can see it killed the, it killed the terminal process and that engaged the destructor as evidenced by the fact that this number destroyed 47 got printed. Okay, so how does it do this? Um, the magic under the hood is that first it does a semantic analysis pass, right? So it takes the code that you've written and then it uses Zig's comp compile time facilities to generate a JSON file that is a manifest of all of the types and all of the functions that exist inside the code that you've written. It then, it then executes a small program and then exports that JSON and then Ziggler reads that JSON and then builds a model um, for what needs to happen. Once, once, that's, uh, once that's done, um, it then generates the build artifact and then it builds the full thing with, ex with uh, shim uh, functions written in that do all these conversions using a small like standard beam library that I've written uh, that I've written that will correctly do all of these, all of these uh, translations. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip over this, but the, import, uh, the next demo that I want to show you is you can do this in Erlang too. And how this happened, I gave a lightning talk about this at CodeBeam. I think it was maybe before the, just before the pandemic. It was the last CodeBeam USA before the pandemic. And, uh, and Robert Verding was there, and he said, you know, you should really do this in, in Erlang. And the way you're going to do this is with parse transforms. And I was very scared to work with parse transforms. Um, and then eventually I said, you know what? I'm just going to dive into it and then do it for, for, for the talk. And I did it. And it really was quite fast. It took me about two days to get parse transforms working. Um, so here is the result. Um, and so this is what it looks like to, uh, to, to write, to use Ziggler in, in Erlang. So instead of doing use Zig, you just uh, supply the parse transform Ziggler. Uh, you declare which of the functions that are inside of your Zig code you want to export. Um, and then you just supply the same options that you would supply in Elixir um, as, a, as an annotation or, or as an attribute Zig opts. So in this case, what we're going to do is we're actually going to return a, um, a tuple. And remember how atoms were just uh, enums. This is an anonymous enum, OK. And then we're just going to wrap the number in this OK tuple. And this form here is, what, is how Zig does its tuples. Really, they're anonymous structs with like fields that are 0, 1, 2, 3, but um, under the hood in Zig. But uh, those are what they call tuples. And so I said, hey, if they've got tuples and we've got tuples, then we should make their tuples be our tuples. So let's test this. Uh, and this requires a number, U32, so let's do 34. Uh, oops, I need to wrap OK. And you can see that it returns the atom OK with 34 inside of a tuple. All right, the last demo that I want to do is something really exciting. Um, 
So Zig is designed to have extremely good C interop. And one of the ways that it has really good C interop is that it ships with a C compiler. And moreover, all of the things that it can do with Zig, like semantic analysis, it can also do with C. So it can reach into that C header and understand what the shape of all those functions are in the C header. This is like kind of like mind blowing, in my opinion. Um, and so because it can do that, I can also leverage all of the um, JSON uh, uh, manifests that I create and just do that with C instead of just instead instead of just uh, instead of just um, uh, uh, instead of just Zig. So the demo needs a little bit of background. So Blas is the C library called, uh, short for basic linear algebra subprograms. We're going to be using the cblas underscore daxpy function, um, which I think um, incorporates some very common patterns that you'll see in C. So D stands for double precision. AXPY means it's an alpha x plus y linear algebra operation. And the other thing you should know is that this third, this like fourth, sorry, fifth parameter here is an in-out parameter, right? So all these other ones are const, which means they don't get changed. This is what uh, gets re is the effectively the return value for this for this function. Okay, so let's look at this, and um, so this is what it looks like to use easy C in, um, in, in Ziggler. You have to provide um, this easy C option, tell it which header file you're going to wrap, and you're probably gonna need to either link a library in this case or supply other C files to compile, which there are options for. In this case, we're compiling, we're using the system CBLAS library, right? And then you just declare your, your, the list of NIFs that you would like to import, uh, because in C, the namespace is everything. Uh, we don't, we don't want to import malloc. So if you're doing easy C, you have to say, I want specifically these functions. You can't have it like automatically detect which functions are exported using pub. Um, so in this case, I only want the CBLAS DX, DXPY function. And, um, and because it has this weird return signature where one of the parameters is an in and out, um, I'm saying return parameter number four and derive the length of that because it's an array from argument zero. So CBLAS DA, so, so it's gonna import the CBLAS DAXPY and it's gonna wrap it so that whatever this fourth parameter gets changed to is what gets returned and it's gonna pull the length that it needs so that we don't seg fault from the first parameter. So easy C. So we're just gonna run. And also to showcase that note that like this is a Erlang module, right? So I've interleaved the I've interleaved effectively what is Zig and or C code with Erlang code. So this is like this is just a normal Erlang module. I've just also added this run function that I'm going to export. And you can see what it does is it does the appropriate math. If you wanted to return this as a binary, all you would have to do is to add binary as one of the options for the return. So unfortunately for this one, I have to reload. Uh, Elixir doesn't know how to recompile, uh, incrementally rec rec recompile uh, Erlang source code, unfortunately. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, so easy C demo dot run. So now we can see, instead, it's outputted uh, a float 64, um, uh, a binary of, sorry, these are double precision. So it's a, it's a binary that represents uh, three float 64 values. Okay, so um, so in conclusion, uh, Zig really doesn't just like Elixir. It works really well with both Elixir and Erlang in the Beam ecosystem. I really think that the thing that matches this is that Zig's ability to go between dynamic and static types is basically unmatched. Um, for other things that I haven't shown, um, so there was, I, I had a demo where for time I had to cut out where we show that it can detect a memory leak, which I think is a huge risk for, for, for NIFs. Um, I substitute in an allocator, which instead of uh, allocating memory um, from the beam allocator uh, that ships with the beam, it allocates from a, an allocator that wraps that, which can also do uh, leak checking. Um, 
Some things I didn't show, but if you look at some of the other videos, uh, other presentations I've made on this topic, uh, Zig's async await has fantastic interop with the beam scheduler and cross-platform compilation for Zig, like I mentioned before, is amazing. So, so um, using the same framework, we can compile to an embedded platform and ship that in a in, in a in a in a in a um, Beam project release. Um, so yeah, that's what I've got. Uh, thank you guys for listening, um, and I'll take any questions if anybody has any. Thank you so much for such a great presentation. Um, do we have one question? Yes. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Uh, my question would be to make it like uh, useful in production, uh, there is a question of scheduling and preemptiveness and whether we run those NEVs on dirty schedulers, which may not be great, or whether you have some magic for beam-like scheduling. Yeah, okay. So yeah, I didn't show this, but one of the parameters you can pass to the NIF options, so by default it does synchronous, which just goes straight into the code and comes back out. You can select dirty CPU, you can select dirty IO, just with those atoms. Um, you can do, currently, I'm for, so I will be releasing the 0.10 version of this in the next week, maybe week and a half. Um, it should also release with um, threaded, which will spawn an OS process and run, run your code inside the OS process with no further changes to the code. Um, and also yielding, which is cooperative with the, with the, with the uh, beam scheduler. You have to put these beam.yield functions in wherever you are willing to give up control. Um, and and when, it, when it hits that beam.yield, it will asynchronously go back into the, into the, um, into the um, event, or uh, there's an event loop basically, and that event loop wraps the, the, uh, the way that you do um, you do long running NIFs that is prescribed. So, so yes, and, and with like zero lines of code change except for the one option, you should be able to transition between, uh, between threaded, dirty, and, 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 and uh, yielding. Um, and the beam yield will know which one is in and it'll do the correct thing. And also, if you kill the, if you kill the process that's running uh, a, a threaded, um, a threaded loop, right? When it hits that beam.yield, it knows that it's inside of a threaded and not inside of a cooperative, inside of a yielding, and it takes advantage of that same yield hook to check to make sure that the parent process is alive. And if the parent process is not alive, then it will, it will, uh, it will trigger whatever cleanup you have in that function. So it'll really help your NIFs to be good citizens of the, of the beam that it lives inside of. I don't know if that answers your question. I think that does, yes, okay. Do we have any more questions? Yes. Um, thank you, sir, for, for this presentation. I would like to ask if you have done any kind of benchmarking. No, I haven't. <laughs> okay. Um, Zig tends to be really fast and uh, if you do Zig programming correctly, you can take advantage of things like SSE really easily. So, um, you know. So that's potentially 10, 10x, 100x Pot on certain algorithms. Potentially, yeah. And it's pretty easy to do SSE. I mean, not on this project, but I've done some Zig coding for fun uh, where I've, I've, I've gotten like, I think it was like 5x faster than C because SSE was just so easy to do. Thank you. One more question, last one then. Hey, uh, so regarding building this, is the entire thing written in Zig? I mean, the, the build, uh, Steps as well, or okay. So or building the Erlang part and the Zig part separately. Um, s all right. So uh, okay, for Erlang, the way you have to do it now is you just have to put in. You have to um, load the file. I think, oh, man, um, 
There's a rebar three plugin that will let you get stuff off of hex.pm, I think. Uh, there's a hex plugin. I think there's also like an Elixir plugin. So you put those two, thing, two things in and it will build. Um, almost all of the steps that happen happen in the beam. Um, the only part that happens in Zig is the actual, uh, well, the semantic analysis um, and then the, comp and the compilation. And um, when you create a Ziggler project, it will ask you if it can download Zig off of the internet if you don't have it yet. Uh, it'll pull that package and then it'll create, um, it'll create a, uh, its own, ver its own like isolated Zig compile tool chain inside of the priv directory. You can also tell it, I've, got, or I've already got Zig on my system. Um, please use the one that I have locally. Um, so, I, I, uh, but the Zig build process itself is entirely contained as part of the Zig project. So it has its own builder. You don't need auto make, C, C make, config. You don't need those tools. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, so let's give a big applause and go for lunch.